Well, good evening and welcome to this evening worship service. And we're coming from Nogali Reform Street in Church. Special welcome to the members of the Mavadi congregation. But to all who are listening in this evening, uh, may we be helped by the Holy Spirit to worship God in spirit and in truth. And we begin by singing praise to the Lord's name. We're going to sing from Psalm 130. Here's a psalm which says that we are to reverence the Lord because with him there is forgiveness. Forgiveness is a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing to be forgiven by a fellow human being. How much more wonderful it is then to know that when we sin against God, in Jesus Christ, there is forgiveness. So it's Psalm 130. We sing praise to our God. such as we are. We admit, O Lord, that day by day, week by week, and year by year, throughout our lives, and even from our earliest years, we sin against you. We break your law. We go against your will. We do our own thing. We sin against you in our thoughts. We sin against you in what we say. We sin against you in what we do. We sin against you, O God, in what we often fail to do. And so how wonderful it is to know, O Lord, that through the finished work of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour, there is the sure, uh, there is assurance of the forgiveness of all our sins. We praise you for Jesus Christ, who came into this world and who lived a life of perfect obedience to your law, and who also died an atoning death on Calvary's cross, so there might be forgiveness for all who put their trust in him. We did pray this day, O God, that is. Many people throughout the world hear, this, hear messages such as will be heard here today from your word, hear the gospel. We pray there will be many 
who will find the joy and the peace and the hope of forgiveness through coming to faith in Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord God, you please to minister to each one of our hearts. You know each one of our needs, O Lord. We pray that you might be pleased to meet our needs out of the riches of your grace in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We turn to read now two passages from the Word of God. The first one is in the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus, chapter 16. Book of Leviticus, chapter 16. And just a short reading from verse 11 down as far as verse 17. This is just an example, one example among many, of sacrifices that were offered under the Old Testament in worship to God. This is describing some of the sacrifices that were offered on the Day of Atonement. Verse 11. Let us hear the word of God. Aaron shall bring the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household, and he is to slaughter the bull for his own sin offering. He is to take a censer full of burning coals from the altar before the Lord, and two handfuls of finely ground fragrant incense, and take them behind the curtain. He is to put the incense on the fire before the Lord, and the smoke of the incense will conceal the atonement cover above the testimony, so that he will not die. He is to take some of the bull's blood, and with his fingers sprinkle it on the front of the atonement cover. Then he shall sprinkle some of it with his finger seven times before the atonement cover. He shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people, and take its blood behind the curtain, and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it. In this way, he will make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins have been. He is, do the, he is to do the same for the tent of meeting, which is among them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one is, the, is to be in the tent of meeting from the time Aaron goes in to make atonement in the most holy place until he comes out, having made atonement for himself, his household, and the whole community of Israel. Well, turning now to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews and it's chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, we begin our reading at verse 16 and read down to the end of the chapter. So Hebrews chapter 9 and reading from verse 16. Let's again hear what the word of God says. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it. Because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is, is living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves, together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the, sc the scroll on all the people. He said, This is the blood of the covenant, which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in the ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifice than these for Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary. There was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages, do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So we draw our reading to a close there in verse 28 of Hebrews chapter 9. And it's especially in verse 26 that we want to uh, think about this evening. Verse 26, the greatest sacrifice ever made, the greatest sacrifice ever made. 
In that verse we read, Then Christ who had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Sacrifice is a word that we uh, hear a lot about, isn't it? In these days, in the midst of this ongoing coronavirus crisis. In particular, the sacrificial service being rendered by the health workers and the care workers is being greatly appreciated. The Thursday evening clap in their honour has become a feature of life throughout the United Kingdom. And in particular, the more than 100 health and care workers who've died in the course of their work already, they are being praised for making the ultimate sacrifice, losing their lives in the course of caring for others. It might also make us think of other great sacrifices that humanity has made. We might think of those who sacrificed their lives during the world wars in order to preserve the liberty of our land. Their sacrifices are recorded in impressive memorials and they're remembered in important ceremonies at least once a year. Or think again also of the sacrifices made by parents to ensure the welfare of their children. Sacrifice of time, effort and money for the good of their children. And on a more individual basis, haven't there been remarkable cases where a person has donated one of their kidneys to a sibling who's in need of a kidney transplant? A very admirable sacrificial action. Yes, indeed, those who make sacrifices of various kinds at some cost to themselves and sometimes at the ultimate cost of their very lives are rightly appreciated, admired and celebrated in our world. This evening, therefore, I want, to, want you to think about the greatest sacrifice that has ever been made, the greatest sacrifice, the most costly sacrifice, the sacrifice we read about there in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 26. Here it is again. Christ appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself, by the sacrifice of himself. Now here's a sacrifice that involved the greatest cost and that has brought the greatest good to the greatest number, the greatest good to all those who have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's a sacrifice not to be overlooked, not to be forgotten about, a sacrifice that needs to be proclaimed and made known to those who have not, not yet understood it or appreciated it or accepted it. Let me ask all of you listening here this evening, what does this sacrifice mean to you? What does this sacrifice mean to you? Have you seen its importance for your well-being? Have you grasped the immensity? Have you grasped the immensity of Christ's sacrifice as being truly the greatest sacrifice that has ever been made? To enable us to appreciate the immensity of Christ's sacrifice, let's focus our attention on three aspects of this sacrifice as are found here before us in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 26. And the first one is this. Think about the timing of Christ's sacrifice. The timing of Christ's sacrifice. God's word tells us here that Christ, quote, appeared once for all at the end of the ages to make this sacrifice. You see the words once for all. They appear more than once in this passage in the book of Hebrews. They're very important words. You see, they point us to the finality of Christ's sacrifice. In other words, his sacrifice was offered once at a particular point of time and it does not need to be repeated. It doesn't need to be offered over and over again. As you may be aware, there are many references to sacrifices in the pages of the Old Testament. Indeed, it has been said that without an understanding of sacrifice, we cannot fully understand the message of the Bible. Thus, for example, most of the book of Leviticus 
has to do with regulations about the offering of sacrifices at the tabernacle. We read a little earlier one small portion from the book of Leviticus where the sacrifice to be offered on the Day of Atonement are described. And in many other pages of the Old Testament, you will read about sacrifices being offered. Here in the book of Hebrews, there is a major emphasis on the superiority of Christ's sacrifice to the sacrifices that have been offered in the tabernacle or the temple. If you read over the ninth chapter of Hebrews again, you'll see that one key difference between the sacrifices of the Old Testament and the sacrifice of Christ has to do with the issue of frequency. The issue of frequency. The Old Testament sacrifice, you see, had to be offered again and again, year after year, continually, repeatedly. But Christ's sacrifice was offered once for all, once for all. You see, all those animal sacrifices were not effective in themselves. They only pointed forward. They pointed forward to the one perfect sacrifice that Christ offered on Calvary's cross. Verse 26 tells us, doesn't it, this was the reason for Christ appearing on earth, to offer that perfect sacrifice. And he does not need to keep on appearing, for he finished his sacrificial work. It does not need to be repeated. The only time that Jesus will appear again will be at the very end of time. And as verse 28 tells us, he will appear then not to bear sin, not to offer any sacrifice, because that sacrifice has been offered once and for all. He will appear then to bring in the fullness of salvation to all those who are waiting on him. Hence the gospel of Jesus Christ urges us not to try in vain by our own efforts to earn favour with God. Rather, it urges you and I to put our faith in the finished work of Christ. You shouldn't try to add anything of your own to that sacrifice, but rest yourself fully upon it for salvation. Nothing more is needed. Nothing more can be added. To try to add something of your own is futile and foolish and fatal. To be saved, your attitude should be that that's expressed in those famous words, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. So in relation to the timing of Christ's sacrifice, we must understand it was offered once for all. And we should also take note of the phrase, at the end of the ages, at the end of the ages. What does this mean? What does this tell us? Well, this tells us that the sacrificial death of Christ occurred according to God's precise timing, his precise timetable. And that it is a momentous landmark in the unfolding of human history. As the preacher Alexander McLaren has said, the cross is at the centre of the world's history. The incarnation of Christ and the crucifixion of our Lord are the pivot around which all the events of the ages revolve. Doesn't our Western calendar even testify to this, at least the traditional Western calendar that we've been using some, some alter it nowadays, but the traditional Western calendar is divided into two time periods, isn't it? B.C. and A.D. B.C. meaning the years before Christ, and A.D. meaning the years of our Lord, since the Lord came. In other words, the death of Jesus Christ brought in, uh, into being a whole new age. Life and immortality has been brought to light through the gospel of Jesus Christ. In recent times, some have got very excited about the supposed dawning of the age of Aquarius, what we call New Age people. But they're mistaken. What we should be really excited about is the New Age that actually dawned through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For it says that he offered this sacrifice 
at the end of the ages. In fact, the Bible highlights the perfect timing of the cross as the outworking of the perfect plan of God for the salvation of his people. You can read in Galatians 4 and verse 4 that was when the time had fully come or in the fullness of time that God sent his son into the world to redeem and save his people. And Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, Romans 5 and verse 6 declares, you see at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for us at just the right time. See, God is not like us. Sometimes you and I, we act too hastily. At other times, we delay too long and leave it too late. We often act at just the wrong time. But here, we're assured that Christ died at just the right time. And he died once for all. And therefore, what you and I need to do is keep looking back to that cross and put all our hope and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ and the perfect sacrifice that he offered there. So having first of all seen the perfect timing of Christ's sacrifice, let's now think about the precise nature of Christ's sacrifice. The precise nature of a sacrifice. What kind of sacrifice did he offer? Well, once more, the book of Hebrews is keen to draw a contrast between the sacrifices of the Old Testament and the true sacrifice offered by the Lord Jesus. What did the Old Testament sacrifices consist of? Well, they involved the sacrifice of animals, didn't they? They consisted of the blood of sheep and of goats or bulls. But as Hebrews tells us here, such animal sacrifices could never be sufficient to take away the sin of guilty men and women. The life of an animal could never be a, a sufficient substitute for the life of a man or a woman. And hence, look at what Hebrews 9 verse 26 tells us about the kind of sacrifice that Christ offered. He did not bring the blood of animals into the temple. No, not at all. The verse declares the amazing truth, the amazing truth, that he did away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. The sacrifice of himself. Do you see that at the end of verse 20, 26? To do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Yes, by the sacrifice of himself. And you see, this is what makes the sacrifice so costly, so immense, so invaluable, so incomparable. For think about who Jesus was. Think about who Jesus was. Yes, he was fully and truly human and therefore perfectly qualified to stand in the place of sinful men and women. But he was more than that. He was also the Son of God who could therefore offer a sacrifice of unlimited, of infinite value of sufficient value to cover over the sins of all who believe in him. Isn't this why that famous verse, John 3, 16, speaks in such exalted terms of the love of God? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God's love is so, so great because what did he give for? Who did he give? He gave his one and only son. And he gave him over to a sacrificial death on the cross. For the sake of an undeserving world. For the sake of unworthy sinners such as you and me. Here's how Octavius Wunzel summed up the reason why Christ died on the cross. Who delivered up Jesus to die? Not Judas for money. Not Pilate for fear, not the Jews for envy, but the Father for love. Yes, Judas did want the money. Yes, Pilate was cowardly. Yes, the Jewish leaders were envious. But the ultimate reason for the death of Jesus was the amazing love of God. For God so loved the world 
to give his one and only Son. Another reason why Christ's sacrifice is so wonderful has to do with the fact that it was entirely voluntary on his part. He sacrificed himself and he did it willingly. He willingly gave himself over to the death on the cross. And once more there's a contrast here with the animal sacrifices. Those animals were dragged along to be sacrificed in the temple. They didn't do it voluntarily. But Jesus went voluntarily with a deliberate intention, with a deliberate will to the cross. Listen to what he told his disciples. Those words of his that we read in John chapter 10. Verses that, that we read in John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. Here's what we read there. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life. Only take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Did you hear that? Jesus laid down his life of his own accord, of his own will. No wonder then the Apostle Paul wrote of Jesus as being the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. May each of you listening here this evening be able to exclaim with similar wonder and devotion. Jesus is the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. For me. So we've already seen how Christ's sacrifice was so great because of its perfect timing and because of its precise nature. And now let's see from Hebrews 9 and verse 26 that its greatness also derives from its great purpose. Its great purpose or its great effect. What was the purpose of Christ's sacrifice? Well, look what we're told here in verse 26 that Christ sacrificed himself. To do away with sin. To do away with sin. That's strong language. The phrase to do away with has the idea of cancelling it out completely. Wiping it away completely. Totally. Now of course that doesn't mean that since the death of Christ no one sins anymore. Far from it. Even as Christians by our anger by our envy, by our lying, by our impatience, by our greed, and in a host of other ways. We all sin against God even every day. Sin has, not, sin has not been done away with in that sense. Although as believers we should hate sin and seek to put it out of our lives. But sin has not been done away with in that sense. Rather, what's meant here is that Christ by sacrificing himself has done away with the guilt of of sin and the penalty due to sin for all those who believe in him. By his death, he has delivered all those who put their trust in him from the terrible penalty of eternal death due to sin. And he's given to them the tremendous gift of eternal life. Now let's just compare for a moment, compare this for a moment to what the NHS workers are doing by putting their lives on the line, by being willing to risk and sacrifice themselves for the good of their patients. Thereby they are playing an admirable part in helping to deliver many people from the threat of physical death. Even our Prime Minister has acknowledged his debt of gratitude to several of them. But think about how much more Jesus has done for all those who have put their faith in him. He has delivered them once for all from the threat of eternal death by doing away with the guilt of their sin. How much more then should we who believe in him, should, how much more then should we not be talking about and rejoicing in his great sacrifice? Here's how Isaac Watts uh, summed up in famous words. Was it for crimes that I had done, he groaned upon the tree? Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. The purpose of Christ's sacrifice was then to do away with the guilt of sin and to ensure a full and free forgiveness for everyone who puts their faith in him. It's so well summed up in those words that John the Baptist used when he pointed to Jesus, when he said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So 
So let me ask you, have you seen Jesus in this way? Have you admitted your need to have your guilt removed? Have you realized that you need your sin to be done away with? If you haven't yet done so, I would urge you, I would plead with you, behold the Lamb of God, to look to him who alone can take away your sin. This was the great purpose of his sacrifice and your greatest need. Yes, of course, it's a wonderful thing to be saved from the coronavirus. It's a far, far more wonderful thing to be saved from your sins. And no doctor, no nurse, no scientist, no politician, no clergyman can take away your sins. Only Jesus can do that. That's the very meaning of his name. He's to be called Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. The sacrifice of Jesus then is so, so great because it involved the greatest cost, even the death of the Son of God. And because it meets, meets our greatest need to have our sins done away with. Make sure then, dear friend, make sure that you've had your sins done away with. Finally, you and I, we believe in Jesus as we ponder the greatness of the sacrifice. As we ponder its perfect timing, its precise nature and its wonderful purpose. Shouldn't we be inspired to give ourselves more and more to Jesus in sacrificial service? It was C.T. Studd who gave up so much, in fact, made many sacrifices himself to serve as a missionary in China and elsewhere, who wrote, If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. No sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. And after, after all, didn't Jesus tell those who wanted to be his disciples that they must be willing to deny themselves and take up the cross? There's a cost involved. Let's be honest, we can be very reluctant to take up the cross. We'd much rather have a form of Christianity that doesn't require us to take up any cross, that does not involve too many sacrifices. Let's be honest, how half-hearted, how half-hearted we can be in our commitment to Jesus Christ. How little, perhaps, you can be willing to do for him and for his church. If there's something to be done for his people, how inclined you may be to leave it to somebody else. How little hassle you can prepare to put up with, put up with for the sake of Christ. How slow, perhaps, you can be to speak of him lest you suffer a little bit of embarrassment or mockery. How slow perhaps you can be to stand up for him, lest it involve a bit of unpopularity. How slow perhaps you can be to tell others of him, lest they think you odd or strange or fanatical. How little perhaps you can attempt for him, as you just think it too costly. Perhaps you say to yourself or think to yourself, ah, that would involve too much time that involved too much money, that involved too much effort. But don't you see how much Jesus gave for you? Don't you see how he sacrificed himself to take away your sin? And don't you see how he shed his precious blood for you? Don't you see how he died on that cruel cross for you? Surely there is no sacrifice too big for you to make in return for the greatest sacrifice that was ever made. So won't you resolve even this evening to give yourself far more to serving him in the light of the fact that he gave his all for you, that as this verse in Hebrews reminds us, he appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. And so dear friends, as we contemplate the amazing sacrificial love of Jesus Christ. How heartily we should now join together in the singing of these words from Psalm 116. I love the Lord.
because he hears my voice. He hears my plea. So while I live, I call on him who turned his ear to me. I love the Lord. We should love the Lord and sing praise about our love for him because he sacrificed himself for us, the greatest sacrifice ever made. Let's sing these words now in Psalm 116 in praise to our gracious and loving God. I love the Lord because he hears my voice, he hears my plea. be with you all this evening and forevermore.